the manifest to look at that P, right? Is that right? P. And then we have for the other woman, where you know, X1 is mapped to B, X2 goes to C, and X1 is mapped to B, X2 goes to D. That's how this is intended to be read here, these tables. Uh, I'm not sure if so it, it, it is arranged a little differently in 62, but you see this the same thing, right? So there are four lines, each of them corresponding to one of these four functions, and each of them assigns the value to x1 and the value to x2, nothing else. And now for the first time we have, um, not an indefinite, but some content here, namely x1 catches x2, and this eliminates a whole bunch of assignments. This time the domain is the same after the update, still it's x1, x2, but now uh, you know, the content comes through this condition. There has to be the catching going on between these things. And so we end up with just one possibility. And uh, scratch x2, x1, fortunately, is true of that single possibility. So that's the output. And what it means is now we um, have not only learned all of this, that there is a woman called the cat and so on, but we have also learned, we can now be sure that x1 is assigned to A and x2 is assigned to B. And for subsequent reference, that will stay, that information stays in the context. Uh, okay, yes. So that's how it works. And uh, I said earlier that I find this whole story about file change semantics sort of contradictory because. On these pictures where we had these panels, these kind of cards, right, there were sentences written, little assertions that looked like a syntactic object of some language. But that's not at all the case here. The assertions about x1 and x2 that got us to the output state of here, 15, 64, the assertions that got us there are lost. We don't actually know there's no trace in this file of uh, what was said about x1 and x2. We only know that something was said which entails that x1 is a woman and x2 is a girl, all these things. We know those facts, but we don't know, we don't have a, a record of the linguistic expressions that conveyed that information. Makes sense to see what I mean. So in that sense, it's not at all like a file part. It's really misleading to think of it in those terms. Only content and only information is kept. Nothing about the code or the, you know, the signal is uh, left after this. Well, so that's my little my little beef about. System. And we have here some uh, 65, some um, one more definition which we don't necessarily have to go through. This is now for a quantifier every, this is I think a zeta and theta. I'm taking this notation from other people. Don't ask me why they suddenly use three quarters here. I mean, it worked well so far without them. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, and such rare three quarters. No one knows how to pronounce. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, satisfaction set for Chuma uh, X1. Uh -huh. First, that satisfaction set. Uh, I'm not sure. This is up here. No, 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 no. no. Uh -huh. That's uh, yeah, that. That's it. Yeah. In, in that uh, uh, set, uh, I'm not sure why uh, that existence. Oh. Yeah. oh, because here, yeah, yeah, but, but the empty set is a subset of A. But, uh, but 
But I, I'm fixing to me that F is, uh, should be the single of F D set. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point. Is there another, is there another uh, one of my typos? You're right. Quite right. It's true. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, you see where I got that. Um, uh, well, I can't quite see it right now in this. Oh yes, it's, yeah, I, I made that. That's my type. Yes, my typo again. Okay. Right? Yeah, it actually is an empty set of functions. Um, and sorry, it's a, yeah, a set containing only the empty function. That's that's how to paraphrase it. Right. Uh, the second one. Sorry, the first one. I'm gone. It's this right? Okay, it should be like this. Right. Thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, once once there are things in there, there's no longer a problem. But it's easy to, <laughs> to miss miss some of these parentheses. <laughs> okay, uh, well, that's not necessarily. It looks so closely at 65. Um, if you look back to the um, dynamic predicate logic, for instance, you see that the quantificational structure of this. Definition is again pretty much the same that we had for uh, conditionals before. So you know, so those satisfy those assignments a such that for all extensions b now b you know, for all supersets of a, which are in the satisfaction set after the update with the first clause. Uh, and I may again be missing something here, but uh, there is one, there is a further extension which is also there after processing the second clause. Yes, uh, what's missing here is there is a C such that, just as before, uh, B is a superset of A, and C has to be a superset of B in 65. So, you know, this, this uh, provides for the case that each of these constituents did, um, did uh, essentially introduce new discourse reference. And so any way of extending our assignment A to accommodate the new discourse reference of the first sentence, first constituent, uh, must also um, have descendants, as it were, right? Uh, it, must, uh, it must be possible to extend that further to an assignment that satisfies the second constituent. Yeah. But I think you see that this is pretty much the same, right? It looks different, but it's the same kind of theory. Um, so, oh, you don't think that's pointless, therefore. Uh, okay, 16, 18. So the last thing I want to look at is this uh, DRT. Now this, I think you are most likely to have encountered, at least the linguists among you. Um, I'm not sure. But this, have you seen these structures, these boxes and things? Not all that much. Yeah. OK, Hans Kamp, 1981. So this is pretty much about the same time as Heim wrote her dissertation. But um, they didn't find out about each other until very shortly before both of them published their work. It's a famous story. They were both, both scared to death to find that someone else was doing exactly the same, the same kind of work. And we'll see that it's pretty much exactly the same. So again, we see boxes. This time, the boxes are not a metaphor but the real thing. Um, in the high file change semantics, we were just asked to name the file core or something, the file box. 
Here, these boxes that we see on page 19, they are expressions of a formal language. Uh, there is, so there is a language which has a syntax and a semantics. And it, it looks like these boxes. You can imagine in the early 80s, it's kind of a click and drag sort of you know, uh, thing. So graphical user interfaces were just beginning to pop up. Um, and you build these representations um, by translating English sentences into expressions of this language, this box language. And there is an algorithm which actually doesn't take just uh, sentences, not just strings, but parts of strings, together with their syntactic tree. And there's a certain pattern matching going on, top down, by taking, you know, taking the tree apart. Whenever you have reached branching points of a certain type, you put a structure of a certain form into this box. That's basically how it works. Um, this mapping from syntax to the boxes is, you know, it's, it's a little involved in itself, so I didn't put much of that here, so I hope you can help me with that. And the box grows, just like our file system grew before. Now here we, add, we have both of these reference recorded in this box above the line, which just means that those two have um, been used. They are, they are in use currently in this box somewhere. And then below the line, there are conditions, as they're called, little assertions about these reference. And now, if you look at the definitions in the middle of the page, 67 through 70, you see that this is a different way of defining what the boxes are. This time, not drawing them as boxes, but writing them as a kind of command line format. That is, you know, you know, in the letters and things. Now, um, the fact that Kamp used these boxes is probably the main reason why this theory was so extremely successful among linguists. Everyone just jumped on it because it's so visual. Right. Uh, whereas these definitions down here, 67 through 70, you see, I and mean, it already gets a little hairy, right? Uh, we, can, we can see um, from these definitions what sorts of boxes are allowed. So let me walk you through that 67 and so on. Uh, there are two sets that we are defining. A set gamma of conditions. Those are things that go below the line that are sorted off the disclose reference. And this other set, kappa, of boxes. Okay. And the first clause says that something of this, well, you know, an atomic sentence predicate with its argument is a condition. Well, that's clear enough. It should be right. So, p of x one, for example, is a condition, um, and the equality is also a condition. Okay, we can skip that. Now comes something interesting. Um, if we have a list of conditions, c one through c m, then a structure like this, uh, which has some list of some list of discourse reference, doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't have to be as many as there are conditions. So this is x n, and then we have these conditions. This sort of thing is a box. Is a box. I mean. I'm not right drawing it as a box, but it's the same thing that we saw earlier, right? And stuff above the line and stuff below the line. Um, and then the last clause says that um, boxes can be combined into conditions. So down here in the 
this area where you put information about this discourse reference. Not only can you have little assertions like x1 is a dog, but you also can have things like um, an embedded box which has its own reference, perhaps there's some y which is not listed up here, and then something about y and so on. So it's this it's recursive goes on indefinitely. Um, and so yeah, I'm writing it in this other format, it would be something like x1, and then perhaps there is something x1 or something x1. x1 is a dog, and then we have x2 and writes. Uh, oh, well, I don't know, a man, x2, and bytes, x2, x1, right? Man bytes dog is more interesting than dog bytes man. Okay, this is also a box. So, they are available. And uh, now, this embedding of boxes, that's where the action happens, where we seal off certain areas. For example, this Y is not accessible from outside of this negation box. It is accessible from inside. So, when you at each of these levels of embedding, what what is above it? Outside the, in the in the um, embedding boxes is accessible from here. So you can refer to X down here. You cannot refer to Y out here, that you cannot do. Uh, why? Because this is ensured by the interpretation process. These boxes are also evaluated through the dynamic procedure. This is one way of finding it. And then Y actually isn't there out here. It's a bit like this Heim system where when you do the negation, you insert this thing. But once the negation is over, you pop out of this local context. OK, now furthermore, there are these uh, conditional structures in 71. This is actually, well, yeah, the, the sort of standard canonical representation of sense like this. If a woman catches a cat, it scratches her. Um, so we have one of these other structures. Um, where two boxes are combined into one. Well, it's on the page that I have to write it here. So, so the arrow is also available as one of the connectors. Okay. Every cat scratches a woman is interpreted in exactly the same way as um, a conditional. If you look at this 71 and 72, they have the same structure. Um, in 71, we have indefinites introducing this course reference. In 72, we have basically variables bound by the quantifier f But in terms of this box language, if we translate them into the same structure, this is what we want. It's just right. I have to say, of course, that how this is interpreted. That's coming up on the next page. Let's actually look at the next page right now. Page 20 at the bottom. 78 through 83. This is again a format which um, actually Hans Kampf didn't come up with, but later subsequent people have proven that this kind of definition is equivalent to what he does. And here it's very much again um, <coughs> obvious immediately that we are dealing with the very same theory as dynamic predicate logic and so on. Uh, so if you define these boxes as relations between assignments, then this is what it looks like. I should say Hans Kamp did not do that. He, he had a model or a structure as, oh, Hans 
some would call this right. So if you don't have here, we build this representation, but that's not the meaning yet. The representation is just you know an expression in a different language. So it has to be interpreted that box of results from the output has to be, as he called it, embedded in a structure or in a model. Which merely means that there must be a way to assign reference to all of these things such that all the conditions are true. Now notice, this is how he sneaks in existential quantification, right? In meta-language. Right? Box like this, according to Kampf's original theory, has a truth value relative to some model. And you find out about this truth value by checking whether there is a way of assigning things, uh, individuals to all of these reference in the right way. Uh, and in that way, they get bound in effect, although there's no existential quantifier in the um, If you define it as relations like this, it comes down to the same thing. Um, he actually had to specify explicitly that this reference, for instance, why here is not accessible from outside. If you do it dynamically like this, then that falls out. Uh, so first, the first few clauses are the same as before. So you know, uh, for example, negation g and h stand in this relation, not k, where k is some box. If and only if they are the same, and uh, k doesn't take you anywhere, right? K running k on you fails. Results in a, an error message, uh, and so on. Um, what the, the only thing here that is different from what we saw before is for eighty-three. The, these atomic boxes, as we might call them, right, which simply have reference and then some conditions. Well, they don't have to be atomic, but it is um, the base case of this uh, recursion on um, complex boxes. And um, so what I'm writing there is uh, two assignments stand in this relation. Yeah. <coughs> uh, C1, this was Xn and Cm. Right. If and only if, now here, um, G and H stand in this relation, um, X1 circle. Um, <coughs> number of circle xm where the circle is relation composition <coughs> there is some some assignment you know that you get from to from x via x1 from g there is some k that you get to like this from that k there is some l that you get through with the next one and then there is some uh, well, some more stuff, and ultimately you reach H, right? So there is a path through all the assignments that has length n and leads you from G to H. Right? If you think of these assignments as a graph with the arrows, right? Each of this um, is um, a set of arrows. There is a path of length n taking you from G to H. This is what we saw before with just one um, variable. Now, uh, you know, this is like having an existential quantifier that binds several variables. It's not such a mysterious thing. Or having a stack of existential quantifiers. And then, of course, these guys here, these conditions, which are now interpreted um, I say come out there, sorry, um, they are interpreted um, individually, separately. 
they also take you from G to H. That has to be the case. Um, so uh, what, what differs here compared to the earlier thing is that the earlier systems is that we have multiple assertions here and multiple variables here. Before, we simply said for the existential quantifier, uh, these two standard relations, uh, the G stands in this relation to H, and also, well, uh, H of x1 is in the denotation of p. Um, but this is the same as saying this. Um, yeah, and now we have more of these because one box can contain multiple occurrences of various assertions. That's all that uh, the only difference. Okay. Well, what is the formula you write? We are here. So it's a uh, you write. Uh, yeah, we didn't have that on. If you look on page um, DPL. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, I was referring to DPL, claiming that this is pretty much what we did there for the existential quantifier. Oh, actually, it says there is a K such that G goes to K, and K is O. Yeah. O O. Wait. I think it is this is not good. Default. Yeah, exactly. This, this should be. Yeah. Ah, sorry, yeah. not this one. This was okay. Here. I would like to say. all of those and I should take you from G to H. So assignment differs from G, uh, H different from G with respect to the uh, discourse referent, but uh, if, well, if there are, yes, if there are some listed, I mean, we have boxes of this form, nothing here, and then some assertions down there. Um, But uh, so there is, yeah, this is actually how it should be, uh, because it means there is a K such that G through X1 takes you to K, and from K you get to H via this other thing. That's, that's the exact analog of the DPL definition. Well, you yeah. don't need a K in the definition of uh, count. Yeah. Yes, well, we don't need a K in the DPL definition either. I could have written for the existential quantifier simply G. We just didn't, I mean, I didn't, have, I didn't use this, but it, um, I could have done it. The definition says there is a K such that you get to K here and then from K to H there. It's the same thing. Now here I was wrong about saying GH and GH. Actually not yeah. true. This this must be some some uh, assignment, but it doesn't have to be either G or H. Yes, so that, that was important. But otherwise it's um, this is you know this is just multiplying several having several occurrences of this. Yeah, this is, I have to correct that. I'll post the corrected word and then. Um, all right. Now uh, that is that pretty much gives us all uh, the technicalities, and we can now still talk a little bit about sort of problematic cases or things like that, if you like. Um, because we have some time left. 
but we actually, yeah, we have some time now. Um, so we already mentioned bridging inferences as a problem. Uh, there's also something which um, is not captured in these early versions of the dynamic theories. For instance, uh, so let's see, you suppose you have a sentence like every boy um, stood up. Walked out. Bad, right? You agree? At least in English, this is bad. You cannot really. Well, it, it is okay, but it's not, not with this co indexing where he refers to each of the boys. Uh, so, well, in principle, ERT makes wonderful predictions about that because you translate this into something like this. So there's nothing up here, but here you say x is a boy, then now um, boy of x. Oh. There's some variation in whether you actually can use the x and say split. X. More often in the literature you see there's a new referent and say y stood up and y equals x. Whichever way you go, it comes out equivalent. Um, this, is a, this is motivated by certain concerns about mapping English to these DRTs. Semantically there's no difference. Uh, and now he walked out, if the, you know, the structure is closed off at this point, then he walked out has to be something like this. Uh, then Z walked. And this thing has to be somewhere present here, but it is not in any way bound or uh, you know, tied up with the boy. Um, and you cannot actually refer into this. You cannot make sure that uh, the Z is linked up with this. Um, now, there are other examples that we mentioned briefly in the break. They walked out where they now refers to the boys, a uh, uh, set of boys somehow. And I mean, this is, this is not plural, but it actually can say this. It's even easier to say all boys stood up, they walked out. Then there's no problem at all. But also, every boy stood up, they walked out, is okay too. And there you see that with some forms, this restriction doesn't hold quite the same. Uh, so these conditionals, they are, they, they um, close off their local context for certain anaphoric expressions, but not all. You can always to the set that you quantify over. So the boys said that you know, this is um, the restriction, as they call it, of the quantificational structure. Now, I'm not claiming, so I'm only mentioning this, I'm not claiming that I have a neat way of accounting for that. Although it is good to know that in evaluating a universal expression like this, uh, you actually look at all the boys, right? You, you actually construct the set of boys. Because you have this quantification, like, right? For, all, for, every, for every arrow that leads to a boy, there must be some further arrow that leads to someone who stood up. Uh, so somehow, you, in, under some circumstances, you can refer back to that temporary local context of the boys. But only with plural uh, pronouns, not with singular ones. And um, there is a lot of debate over how the heck that is supposed to be working out. It's, it's very hard. 
But uh, sometimes even this works. There's even uh, it's even more confusing. For plurals, you can actually look at, for example, this big blue book, Kamp and Ryden, from discourse to logic. It's listed on these uh, references here. This actually says for discourse to logic. I won't notice that this morning too, but I don't fix it anymore. It means from discourse to logic. Uh, Every boy stood up, stood up. He walked to the podium and got uh, his diploma. diploma. People have noticed that these are good too in English. Every boy stood up. Now, this is actually with this. He walked to the podium and got his diploma. If you imagine a kind of graduation ceremony, something like that. Uh, so, this is a blatant counterexample to what we have here. And people have only very vague ideas of when exactly this is possible. It's called this particular. Thing here is an example of telescoping. That's uh, how people call this because you kind of you zoom in on the individual boys, right, and say something. That this was true of each of the boys, um, but it only works if there is some kind of regularity where they all did the same thing in succession. Then you can do this, but only then. Um, now don't ask me why this doesn't work for that. This does. Something they all went one after the other. Uh, then you can do this. I cannot give you the solution. There is literature on each of you. If you are interested in working on any of these topics, I can we can always talk more, I can point you to papers and so on. Uh, this there is some psycholinguistic work on this too, trying to I know it when something like this is possible. Um, but it's hard to characterize. That's what you were getting at. Um, uh, so yeah, what I have presented here was really a simplified word of the basic the basic mechanism at the heart of these theories. But then to get things right you actually have to um, be much more inventive. Another way to extend this DRT business, I said this has been very popular, right, this theory, because it has this graphical user interface. Uh, and it also is responsible for the fact that most, you know, a lot of work in dynamic semantics has been carried out in these box languages. Something else that people have introduced is reference for things other than individuals. Now, the first thing you might think of is sets of individuals, and there is a lot about that, or plurals, and so on. Um, but also events and things like that. So there is a whole tradition that kind of comes out of Davidsonian semantics. Donald Davidson, the philosopher. Are you familiar with that guy? No. no. It's a philosopher. So he was at the beginning of a long, still very active line of research, where the um, main observation was that you can refer to events with pronouns like it, it happened at night, or things like that. Um, that's one observation, which is well, obvious, right? Uh, these pronouns are not mapped to any particular individual, but to some occurrence or something. And the second thing is that in a sentence you can assert varying numbers of things about an event. You can say that John ate. 
this is a philosopher's way of thinking about this. It's not, I mean, the English have some things to say about this, but not much. So John ate, eat John, eat John broccoli. Now here, the English have something to say about when this object can go away and so on. But you have things, eat John broccoli uh, fast, or you have things like in the cafeteria, or in any sort of number of things you can assert about an, um, an event like this. And Davidson wanted to introduce event variables in this language. Because you can refer to them with it, things like that, right? Uh, now the problem then is that this would be something translated as something like there is an event E, and then you assert stuff about that E, um, namely that oh wait, sorry, wait. this was not Davison's idea, sorry. Davison wanted to have it like this. Eat has an additional argument slot for the event variable. It's an eating event, basically. And it involves John and some open-ended list of other things. And this open-endedness is that bothered Davidson and bothered many others as well. Because you can't really, um, well, you know, decide a priori how many things you can put into one sentence as sort of an event. Um, Okay, that's a Davidsonian approach, which later was translated into something like existential quantification, but I was just beginning to draw something like this. There is an event, and then you have a conjunction of things. Uh, it's eating, and the agent of the event E is John, and then there are some other things, right? So now you have a conjunction, of course, there is no limit on the number of things you can join as long as you somehow find a way of putting them together. Okay, so these things are um, reified in this theory. They are they are objects, these events. Now in this DRT then um, well it's not, not specific to DRT but you wonder then about subsequent sentences um, you know, often the event is, of course, implicit. It's not mentioned. You don't say there was an eating event by John. So you say John ate, and then you say he went to a movie to see a movie, or so. And it's observed in English that going to the movie has to come after the eating. Um, not just because you can't eat while you go to the movie, but because uh, non-stative sentences always involve a little um, movement forward by the reference time. And this has been uh, incorporated in this theory by saying that you have event variables, uh, sorry, the well, reference, event discourse reference, right? And then there are also ones for uh, the uh, sorry the individuals as the four objects and there are also states and things and so on and you have you know E is an eating and this whole list of things and when you then put together two representations For two English sentences, uh, there is some, well, no, once, you put the, once you merge them, you have to rename this variable, so we might as well name it right now, F and Y. And then you go on and say, you know, y, X is John, here you say that Y is John and Y went to a movie. Um, now, if you, if you look at it this way, you see that in this in this particular way of building these DRSs, um, do this from the bottom up, from each sentence. Each sentence gets its DRS. I'm saying DRS, sorry, discourse representation structure. That's what this stands for. That's what these are boxes. And then they are merged in some way. What you have to keep track of then is that 
in the resulting structure. You have E and F and so on, and then you have to somehow assert that E preceded F, but only if they are both non-stative. If they are stative, then the time does not advance in the, uh, as the text goes on. Um, so in that way, temporal theories have been spelled out in this, uh, and there are theories of aspect and tense and so on. And uh, the way we keep track of the, um, well, the focal point or the reference point in, over the longer course of the narration in text, right? you can usually work moves forward slowly, but you can have other structures. Uh, okay, well, it's just another little thing. If you work in this area, then this might be something to look at. Well, I go, maybe I should ask if there are any questions for or to be go on say. Sorry, what? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, I just wanted to say I'm sort of tempted to start on this mortal stuff. I shouldn't really do that. You can avoid it. So. Yeah, to me, it seems there is no explanation of why negation blocks, for example, why negation blocks the anatomy. Okay, the system is very beautiful mm -hmm. and sophisticated, but still, you know, the, they, what they did was to uh, uh, stipulate or say something, okay, in this case, the name is blocked. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it can be, uh, you know, passed on. Here, how do you know which non-A works at the back end? Did you ask that question? Yeah. 
part of the gut. Um, well, uh, the, the real story is actually that, at least uh, what people believe, is that you have kind of a, um, uh, say, a little um, area in your memory reserved for you know, taking these notes as a kind of um, scratch paper. Right? So you do this, and then you know what the result is, but this was uh, introduced only temporarily and it goes away. And you know it's not the actual state of affairs, right? Uh, if you believe the assertion of not A, then you also believe that this is false. Still, you had to calculate it. Um, and uh, the existence, if you have an existential and indefinite in the scope of this negation, the existence of the discourse referent with such and such properties is only asserted in here. And the discourse referent itself is only introduced here. Doesn't it make sense that then you can, that's why you don't have it available here. I'm not sure, I'm not a psychologist, but that's how I uh, like to think about that. So drawing these now on top of each other because that's actually how we perhaps should think about that, namely that uh, this is the same context. We have put something into memory, pushed something on top of the stack just for purposes of calculation. Once we have the result, this can be discarded. And uh, it's discarded along with any discourse reference that were used in constructing it. So maybe the same thing can happen to OR. With OR, yeah. With OR. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, yes, perhaps. And yeah, there are, the, well, there are different ideas about what OR does. Basically, what we saw today, I didn't stress the disjunction very much, but um, it's actually not a good account of disjunction. Um, so, basically, saying that if you have, um, say, suppose you have a, an input context C, and then you say A or B, and suppose A or A and B are mutually exclusive for simplicity. Just and they are uh, they occupy this area. So these are the A and not B worlds. These are the not A B worlds, and this is where we have neither. Say. Okay. So the ones the ones over here are discarded. And the theories that we looked at today predict that you end up with this set of possibilities. Which is where this sentence is true. But that can't be quite right. I mean, already with these bathroom sentences, uh, either there is no bathroom or it's in a strange place. Now you see that these two alternatives are kept separate for some time. You can still refer to them separately. Somehow, what you have is a parallel <coughs> representation of the A case and the E case. And there is a nice example, and we should talk about it tomorrow, I think, um, because the, it's in one of the papers that I didn't bring today. Um, either You will either become a nun or marry a tramp. Uh, the tramp will meet you regularly. The, oh God, I don't remember. Tomorrow we'll see. The, the, the idea there is that you can keep these two parallel trends of assumptions and refer to them throughout the further stretch of the discourse. Uh, if that is the case, then what uh, what we do what we want as our interpretation for the disjunction 
is not what we had in the earlier definitions. Let me put it up because I'll uh, talk about that briefly. Um, and it was on page, let's say, dynamic predicate logic, say, uh, page 15. So we have G and H standing in this relation, I or psi. If and only if there is a K, oh, so they are the same, S H equals G, and there is a K such that either G phi K or G psi K. So it simply means, uh, you know, it's, it survives one of these updates. It doesn't matter which one. When you run this test on a whole set of variable assignments, point-wise in this fashion that we talked about, you end up with uh, just, you know, the union of these two and these two different cases of the disjunction are no longer kept separate. And um, an another way to define this would be to actually say that we get two states, you know, two contexts, the A context and the B context, and that those are kept separate. It wouldn't be hard to write well, actually, not writing this rule. Uh, the problem here is, if we wanted to do that, we couldn't do it pointwise on individual possibilities, but we would have to take this as our input. Uh, don't look at each of these individually, because not only do we want to know whether it's still here, but we also want to know in which of the two baskets it ends up. So we have to have a way in this object language to refer to these sets of entities. Once we are there, where when you know we have to keep track of not only what assignment we are in, but where you know what set of assignments that is a member of, then we have uh, basically a modal interpretation of or, for instance. Uh, and well, and. There's, there's all the agreement nowadays that or is actually a modal expression, really, in English. It does precisely this. You have these alternatives. They don't need to be disjoint. They may overlap as possible. Right? But in any case, you keep track of both of them. Um, uh, so that is one area where this DRT, this discourse representation theory, has been used, but not with the definitions that we saw today, where we have these boxes. So we have this thing or the other. Each of these is a box. And then the body of decide what this thing means. Uh, you can give this all kinds of definitions. What we saw today is simply uh, says it's those assignments which are true one or the other. But you can also say that you know, um, this is how you keep it separate. Um, I'm playing a little loose with this because this, uh, I, there are lots of developments that I lost over in saying, what, I'm saying this right now. Uh, in the bathroom sentence, for instance, uh, so either there is no bathroom or it's not a funny place. If you want then to add more stuff to one of the conjuncts, uh, you need some way to, to refer to these. There is a variant of this discourse representation theory where these boxes have IDs or labels. They're called labels. This is something like A 